Hi, my name is Chris Francese, and I am the project director at Dickinson College Commentaries. Uh, writing effective annotations on classical texts can be done in many ways, and DCC has its own style, which has evolved over several years. The, at the risk of oversimplifying, I distilled our practice into 10 principles or guidelines. Uh, these are intended to help anyone who would like to write commentaries for DCC, and also those who edit the commentaries. Uh, this video lays out the central ideas. In another, I will examine some examples, uh, some commentaries in their natural habitat. And in the third, I will get into the shocking details of our spelling, typographical, and punctuation conventions. All right, number one, most important, model close reading practices. Uh, reading a great work of literature isn't just uh, you know, a way to lord it over your friends. Uh, it can also be a source of intellectual growth, uh, aesthetic satisfaction, uh, and joy. H humanists and scholars like to read slowly and carefully to bring out the precise meanings of words and to appreciate the beauty of the style. Um, they read critically to al be alive to what's left out, what's partial or unfair. Um, they want to take something away and apply it to life and lodge it in the soul. It's a lofty goal, but uh, DCC tries to model this kind of humanistic reading in a basic way by um, offering both explanatory notes that elucidate the language carefully and sometimes close reading essays that delve more deeply into the context and meaning as well. Uh, the other rules flow from this central principle of modeling close reading practices. Number two, uh, respect the reader's time. Uh, our ideal reader is a person who knows enough Latin or Greek to understand the text, but is not already deeply familiar with it. Uh, this reader could be a wily veteran like myself or a novice who just finished the basics of the grammar. The needs are in many ways similar. Um, something that uh, slows me down a few ticks will stop a novice cold. We both uh, need such things explained efficiently for a smooth reading experience. Explanatory notes should be concise, as short as possible, but no shorter. They should stick to what a curious reader would want and need to know to help understand and appreciate the text at hand. Tangentially related material and ancillary texts can be handled in an introduction or in a close reading essay. Number three, separate interpretation from elucidation. Uh, when it comes to these first-time readers that we're talking about, even expert ones, uh, literary interpretation is just not where they're at yet. Uh, in, if you advance a clever observation in a note that doesn't really help elucidate the language itself, you're likely to alienate uh, people rather than to enlighten them. And there's not enough time anyway to make a, a complicated literary argument effectively so best to save that for a close reading essay. All right, uh, next. When the text makes no sense translated literally, translate it idiomatically. Um, now, many commentators on classical texts see translation in a note as vaguely dishonest, like allowing the reader to cheat. Think of it instead as modeling the sort of careful close translation that you'd like to see, not uh, over-literal pseudo-English, uh, but the real satisfying mot juste. Don't Translate huge passages, long passages, of course, because that just re relieves the reader of having to even grapple with it. Uh, but the trick is really to isolate that really troublesome phrase and nail it. Um, if you would like to avoid translation, one effective approach can be to rearrange the words uh, of the original into a more comprehensible order uh, in the note and supply some assumed words. And there may be other concise ways to make the sense clear but don't neglect that first duty. All right, this leads nicely on to number five. Elucidate first, observe second. Uh, when confronted with a tricky phrase, first make clear what's going on, um, whether by judicious translation or a paraphrase or by rearranging the order or whatever you want to do. Uh, then move to whatever comment you would like to make, be it grammatical, historical, literary, mythological, or aesthetic. Uh, don't make a confused reader guess or hunt through to get to the meaning of the words. All right, number six, uh, look out for what is assumed. 
Artistic language, of course, is often suggestive rather than explicit. Uh, readers frequently need to know what's not there uh, rather than, or really what's there but invisible. Uh, for example, uh, an admitted antecedent of a relative pronoun, a half of a compound verb form, the explanation of some constitutional nicety, religious custom, mythological arcana, something that the author takes as common knowledge. All right, number seven, look out for what is typical or atypical. Unlike a novice reader, uh, a commentator knows what is unusual and what's standard, what's distinctive and what's cliche, what's central and what's just peripheral. Uh, the expert can perceive tone and can see interesting word order, uh, striking word choice or addiction. Point these things out. Uh, a novice reader needs to know both what is common to be able to be on the lookout for it next time and also what is weird to be able to see it as weird. And, um, they need to be alerted to something that likely would, they would not have encountered before, but may be quite typical for the author at hand. This rule applies, by the way, to uh, vocabulary that is part of the core vocabulary and hence not glossed on our, um, you know, in the commentaries, but on our vocabulary lists, um, but may be used in an unusual sense. Okay, save space by linking to stable resources. A hyperlink is God's gift to concision. Rather than re-explain the wheel, uh, you can just link to one of the DCC grammars for grammatical points or to Logeon for lexicography, uh, to Wikipedia for literary devices, they're excellent on that, to Perseus for classical texts, to Smith's Dictionary of Greek and Roman Biography and Mythology for those subjects, and to Pleiades for geography. But um, don't link to a news article or a blog post that's likely to be gone in a few years. Uh, most authors, by the way, find it helpful to keep a list of links in a spreadsheet for further use. All right, number nine, go easy on cross-references. Many, many classical commentaries contain long lists of parallels. Uh, but compare rule number two, respect the reader's time. Uh, that's a nice little cross-reference there, yes. Only uh, use a cross-reference when it's genuinely important for comprehension and to spell out what is assumed. Uh, and never include untranslated parallel passages. That's just annoying. All right, number 10, use jargon for a reason. Uh, one flaw in a lot of commentaries is that they try to explain difficult language by simply naming a grammatical construction. Uh, or they explain the tone and effect of a line by merely naming a literary or rhetorical device. Technical terms are okay, but as a tool, not as a substitute for explanation. Keep in mind the variety of grammatical and rhetorical labels that people might be familiar with. Uh, not that you need to use every version of the names for the various subordinate clauses, uh, you know, every time. It, just explain in a way that doesn't simply rely on everybody being fully familiar with your own favorite terminology, at least the first time through. All right, so those are the basic ideas. Uh, please send me an email or leave a comment below with your thoughts. And uh, onward, next time we'll look at some uh, actual examples. Thanks a lot.